processes. But of course, their perspectives are different. Now, it is natural to expect that when perspectives are different in the construction of any knowledge system, they will look different externally. They will look different in terms of their principles, in terms of their theories, in terms of their concepts, in terms of their methods, in terms of their practices, because they are constructed on different foundations or different perspectives. Around two decades of ex functional uh, relationship within our university between Ayurveda and biology, the experience from two decades of functional relationship or research between Ayurveda and biology in TDU has led us to uh, believe to experience that this combination of Ayurvedic biology or Ayurveda and biology can deepen our understanding of biological processes and lead to innovations both in basic and applied biology. Please enjoy the webinar as it will unfold you you know and answer questions on this uh, particular subject thank you very much and my best wishes to everybody my deep respects to dr valyathan who has agreed to be the first speaker in this webinar series thank you over to you Megha. thank you sir i think uh, you overlooked the fact that it is your broad thinking that we are able to actually execute and you're responsible for taking all this forward. Right. So now what we want to do is we want to keep this as a conversation. There's going to be no PPT and no slides. We want to have a frank chat with Dr. Valyathan. And I invite my colleague, Dr. Vishnu Prasad, to introduce sir and start this off. Go ahead. Thank you, Mekha. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. It's really a great honor to have uh, Professor uh, M.S. Valitan today with us for this uh, webinar as the first speaker. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, accepting our invitation and uh, joining with us. Uh, Professor uh, M.S. Valitan is an eminent cardiologist and a medical scientist with a great vision for science and technology research and education. Sir had an illustrious uh, academic career at uh, different institutes in India and abroad. And after returning to India, he uh, took charge as the director at uh, Sri Jitradirinal Institute of Medical Science and Technology in Kerala, where he uh, spearheaded the team who uh, developed the uh, Chitra TTK wall. As he mentioned in one of his uh, interviews, this Chitra chapter fulfilled his dream of combining cardiac surgery, scientific research, and technology development in a seamless manner. And later, after uh, two decades of uh, glorious service at uh, uh, Sri Chitrajanal Institute, so it moved to uh, Manipal as the first vice chancellor of Manipal University. Also, it is uh, uh, very uh, uh, great to you know uh, say that sir is very passionate about Ayurveda knowledge system, and is also a profound scholar of Ayurveda. He has been pioneering the uh, idea that uh, integrating Ayurveda and uh, biology is a, a fertile field for original scientific research at the highest level. It's really an inspirational journey for all of us of the ways to uh, learn Ayurveda in a gurugula form. And his passion for the convergence of modern biology and Ayurveda as a new discipline of science termed as Ayurvedic biology basically resulted in uh, setting up a task force of Ayurvedic biology by the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. So it has been honored with uh, many awards, fellowships, and honorary doctorates in India and abroad for his contribution to the uh, medical science and technology. And Government of India had honored Professor uh, uh, Wilton Sir with the second highest uh, civilian award, that is uh, Patna Vibhushan in uh, 2005. Sir, uh, with that very uh, brief introduction, uh, uh, welcome you once again. And uh, uh, I would like to start the uh, interview with our uh, first question, with your permission, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Darshan Shankar, Vice Chancellor, 
esteemed members of the faculty and all the guests who are taking part in this uh, meeting. Uh, I am honored and very happy to be here today, especially because the course is being started at MSc, first in this country in Ayurvedic biology. And I have myself been honored by this university with a doctorate, so I'm very grateful, very much aware of the honor you are doing me. I think I should say something uh, about the background, how this uh, came about for historical reasons. Some years ago, I think it was 2004, perhaps, there was a meeting of the Indian Academy of Sciences in Bangalore. And uh, Professor T. V. Ramakrishnan, a great physicist, he was the president. And in my talk, he wanted me to talk about Ayurveda. So I was mentioning that uh, uh, the beginnings of Ayurveda and Western science, that interaction. It started in the 16th century when Garcia Diorta, a Portuguese physician, came to Goa, lived there and practiced for 30 years. And he wrote the book on colloquies on the simples and drugs of India and how that caught the attention of the Western world. All the colonizing countries in Europe, they got it translated into their own languages. And many of them came, the Dutch came, the French came, the British came. And their interest to us in, the, in Ayurveda, medicinal plants was the main reason because Garcia had talked about 53 plants. And they wanted to know more about it because they didn't know how to handle tropical diseases. Very heavy mortality among the Portuguese including a viceroy died. So they thought there would be remedies in this. And secondly, they also recognized the commercial potential because pepper was a huge trade and they thought there would be many more like this. So these were the two reasons they were interested. And this went on. And subsequently in the 17th century, Van Reed came, Hortus Malabaricus and Cochin, many of you would know that. Uh, then Roxborough in Bengal, he started Hortus Bengalensis. It didn't become famous. But like this, for till almost 20th century, we had nothing but taxonomy. The entire interest of Western science in Ayurveda was for taxonomy, plants, classification. In 20th century, we had Ramnath Chopra in Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine. As a, he was appointed as a professor. He was the one who changed a little bit, looking at Ayurveda through the window of pharmacology. For the first time, he would make extracts, isolate compounds, study toxicity, animal studies, and so on. That was followed by natural products chemistry, Govinda Chari, Ashima Chatterjee. This went on. They still go on. But that was the background. But modern biology came with the double helix that changed everything. And it was natural that taxonomy, natural products, chemistry, now pharmacology, and there is a new discipline now. So science is looking at Ayurveda through this window of modern biology. So I mentioned this, and I said it should be called the age of uh, Ayurvedic biology is here. So Professor Ramakrishnan, as soon as my lecture was over, he told me, can you please write it? Because we want to publish it as a vision document of the academy. That is how the whole thing started. Very happy that it has reached thus far the resident the course being started, so it is a landmark, and I'm extremely happy about it. Now, there's some questions uh, always come up about this Ayurvedic biology. Now, the first of all, what is Ayurvedic biology? That's a question which is asked. Ayurvedic biology is really their studies of the concepts of Ayurveda, mechanistic basis of procedures of Ayurveda. And observations. I'll give some examples. The concepts, for example, the most important, the best known is the Vada Pitta Kapha. In Ayurveda, this is fundamental because that determines the predisposition to diseases. And that determines the response to treatment. So without knowing this, dosha prakriti, you cannot really practice Ayurveda. That's very important. There is a concept. No experiment or anything has been done, but it has been practiced even in Buddhist Buddha's dialogues, you will find reference to Vadapitta Kapha. So that is how ancient this is. 
So it was determined by physicians based on physical, mental, behavioral traits. That is how the treatment started. That is a concept. Another is rasa. Rasa is not the sixth rasas, which you have Madhura, Pitta, and so on. Those are the six rasas. But rasa is much more. So, for example, virya, vipaka, prabhava, the whole metabolism, what you are eating, how this is metabolized, becomes part of the body. That entire thing is covered by this term. Dosha Prakriti, some research has been done in Ayurvedic biology. But rasa, no such work has been done. In fact, in the Ayurvedic Biology Task Force, we gave a grant to a major institute to do this study. But that study, I think, got aborted. They could not do it for whatever reason. But that is an example of a concept, again. Now, the second category, we can't list all these. I'm just mentioning examples to illustrate. The second is the mechanistic basis of how these agents work in Ayurveda or procedures work. Again, I'll give some examples. Uh, for example, if you are giving panchakarma, everybody knows panchakarma. It is a very important part of uh, medical procedure and treatment. Universally used in the United States, everywhere you'll see panchakarma being used. But when you do this panchakarma, they had a hypothesis how, why this is being done. But what effects does it produce? Can you measure it? In biology, it is a science. You should be able to measure what you are observing. Now here, what is it that you are measuring when you are doing panchakarma? Now that has not been done. So here in Ayurvedic biology, panchakarma certainly is a matter of study for us. Very important. But we should measure. There are a number of things you can measure. For example, Urmila Tate, a very well-known clinical pharmacologist, she had a project from our task force and there she, just to give an example of what is measured, in obesity, the Ayurvedic treatment is basti. That's one of the important things. So they had a treatment in Podar Hospital, obese uh, people undergoing Vachagarma. The main part is basti. Now this basti treatment, certainly it's a uh, three weeks treatment. Uh, so weight loss was very obvious. But the most important thing they observed, the, you know, the one of the insulin resistance is very important in a number of pathologic phenomena, coronary artery disease included. Now, these are cytokines. There are cytokines which will increase this insulin resistance in the body. Now, these obese people, obesity, as you know, it is not simply a lot of fat collected there. This is an endocrine organ. It is very active. It is producing a whole lot of things. So, the pro-inflammatory cytokines in obesity is always elevated. Now, these uh, other hospital subjects, naturally, uh, their cytokines, they were very much elevated. Insulin resistance that was increased. That it is a syndrome, metabolic syndrome. It is all part of that. This was happening. But after the basti started, the important thing for us is the basti treatment started. Within two hours, uh, these cytokine levels, insulin promoting, insulin resistance promoting, they all came down. They stayed down 24 hours later. I think third was 90 hours later, again it stayed low. So this is an example of how nobody ever thought, simply in enema, there's an immunologist from uh, ATREC, which is part of uh, Tata Cancer Center. She was the collaborator for this. She had told me initially, Dr. Valitha, nothing is going to happen. You give an enema and you expect uh, these cytokine levels to come down. How, how can you explain that? But the fact is it did. Now, this is an example, a procedure producing changes. Now, that is part of Ayurvedic biology. There are a number of other procedures. I just gave one example. So that is also part of this. Then there can be observations. For example, in the Charaga says this, is actually taken from Atharva Veda. When animals are sick, we all know normally they don't eat grass or plants, but you will find them sniffing here and there. 
and they'll be chewing some plants, some grass. This is, we have all seen this, even Nathurva, where there is a hymn, pray, paying obeisance to that medicinal plants who heal these animals and so on. Charaka also repeats it. Now that observation, obviously it has to do with uh, sensory mechanism. It has to deal with uh, many other things, how they could identify this. If a drug is chosen for a particular illness, what is the connection between all these observed thousands of years ago? Somebody wants to put up a project on this. It will involve neurology, it will endocrinology, two, two, three disciplines will be involved. But if they have the way of measuring and doing that, that's an excellent project. Nobody has done that. I have repeatedly said this in several times. I hope some veterinary people might put up a project. In a veterinary college, I had gone and talked, but nobody ever put up any project. But this is an example of a observation that also could be a basis of Ayurvedic biology. So there are many, similarly, the uh, processes that we use. Mercury, everybody knows mercury is toxic. But mercury, plasma, resistant, though we use it. We have also done a project on that. Now, how is it the processing of this taking four or five days? Very complicated procedure. All detailed descriptions are available. And when you talk to people, Ayurveda doesn't use it as much as uh, Siddha. But I have asked uh, Dr. P.K. Warrior, the great uh, physician of Portugal. He said, we don't use it very often, but I have used it several times. And I don't feed this. Uh, I don't see renal shutdown and problems like that. This is what he told me. Now, the processing of this mercury, which was done for us by Baba Atomic Energy Center, and they have shown that the mercury sulfide they synthesized in the lab is identical to what particle they produce over several days in terms of the size of the particles, shape, spherical shape of the particle, and the nano transformation, 23 angstrom for our resistance and their mercury sulfide is 19 angstrom. So, you know, so many ways, the proportion of one to one sulfur and uh, mercury, identical. And this was there, and there is no trace of any free mercury. So, a simple the process is changing the biological behavior of this. We are not interested in making basmas. That is not our area at all. But we are interested in this. The biological activity is entirely different. It's bulk mercury. And nano mercury. So, like these, all these uh, basic studies, they uh, constitute uh, Ayurvedic biology. The tools for doing this, they are drawn mainly from materialism methods, I would say. They are drawn from uh, molecular biology, drawn from immunology, biological chemistry, but there is no restriction. Sometimes we may even use physics, for example, this uh, work on mercury, uh, the mercury sulfide. There is a lot of very advanced medical instrumentation instrumentation used. So this is what Ayurvedic biology is. The Thank second you. Thing, yeah, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that, you know, uh, very uh, um, beautiful explanation of what is uh, Ayurveda biology. And uh, to take this uh, discussion uh, further, uh, I would like to have the next question. So in this contemporary uh, uh, time, uh, what is the uh, need of this uh, Ayurveda biology? Is there a need for this Ayurveda biology? We would like to hear from you, uh, your views on that. I would say the need is uh, not the need of a, a scientific community or anything. It is the need of the time. I would put it like that. Uh, because we are, the whole world is moving towards evidence-based practice. That is inescapable, whether it is modern medicine, whether it is any other system of medicine. It is a question of uh, more evidence, better evidence, but evidence will be insisted on. I have recently, not long ago in uh, Trivandrum, an Ayurvedic senior teacher was telling me, fresh students admitted in Ayurvedic for BAMS, they are asking her, show me the proof. So she was telling me, it's difficult to manage. How can I give you proof of Vata Pitta Kapha? So this demand will come, insistent. So taking something on trust, 
I think it is fast disappearing. We have to understand this. So if you want to explain something, it can only be done on the basis of evidence. Maybe that we haven't got all the evidence. We may have only part of it. We have a guess and we are working towards finding that evidence. But evidence always must be there. We have to accept it. Simply, on, even Buddha has said this, simply because a senior person says, don't accept it. That becomes the credo for everybody. So the Ayurvedic biology, what it does is provide evidence. Whether it is, for example, Vada Prakriti, this Prakriti, these Prakritis are different. They are there. It's not simply based on appearance, physical traits, and the Vaidya decides that this is the Prakriti and everybody accepts. So, in fact, another Ayurvedic physician see maybe judging this person differently, inter observer variations. These are known. From time to time, sequentially, these also have been done. The same person sees after a year, then he will give a different opinion. So these uncertainties are all there. That shakes the evidence. So is there some foolproof way of doing this? Evidence. So in, if you are thinking of uh, evidence-based practice, which I think is inescapable, it doesn't matter whether it takes 10 years or 15 years, that's not the issue. But if that is the ideal, then you cannot get away from molecular biology. In this uh, Ayurvedic biology, of which molecular biology is the large part. That is uh, one important reason. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. So, uh, in that context, uh, my uh, uh, next question would be like uh, Is the purpose of uh, Ayurvedic biology uh, to validate Ayurveda, or is there any other, you know, uh, broad uh, uh, other uh, applications for this concept? The answer is an emphatic no, <laughs> because validation is a regulatory term. That is not the function of Ayurvedic biology. Ayurvedic biology is uh, essentially an inquiry, scientific inquiry. Scientific inquiry, they, they have to have evidence. If that evidence is uh, not satisfactory, they have got to work on it again, improve it. So essentially, it is a scientific inquiry. It has nothing to do with validation. As far as I'm concerned, the validation, uh, essentially the validation is uh, in, if you're talking about practice of medicine, validation is a clinical trial experience. That is validation. So suppose I introduce a particular type of treatment. How do I validate it? The validation is only by clinical trial. There is no other way. Theory cannot validate practice of medicine. You may have a good theory. So whether it is Ayurveda uh, or homeopathy or modern medicine, the validation is only from clinical experience. There is no other way you can validate it. Simply because Ayurvedic biology comes up with a theory or some experiment, they cannot validate uh, practice of medicine. But that is evidence. Clinical trial is uh, clinical evidence. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. So, uh, so sir, uh, we have a uh, uh, very uh, diverse audience starting from uh, students to uh, researchers. So, we would like to hear from you some uh, examples uh, uh, from your uh, specific scientific research that you have uh, sort of coordinated in this uh, field of Ayurvedic biology with a kind of, you know, a special uh, uh, remark on the type of uh, expertise that is uh, needed uh, to do that kind of research. So, that will be really helpful for the uh, youngsters to, you know, uh, get into this uh, field, it will be really inspiring for them. I'll give uh, two examples under this Ayurvedic biology scheme. Uh, we had funded two projects which were completed. Uh, one of them was done in animals, simple, straightforward, elegant experiments. That I'll give first. And the second is involving human beings, subjects. That's much more complicated. So I'll give two examples. The first is, uh, was done by Professor Kaluri Subarao, who was a very distinguished uh, uh, biologist, uh, molecular biologist, interested in aging research for many years. He's no more. In Hyderabad, he was, he was there for many years. And the, his uh, model was rat, rat brain, 
and uh, on that he worked for many years on the especially chain breaks single chain breaks of the dna and neurons and astrocytes and uh, the rate of uh, uh, repair how the repair could be improved how they could be assayed all kinds of them must be hundred papers on the subject he was an authority i knew this so i asked him once when we were thinking of this ayurvedic biology i asked uh, professor sobrao can you uh, in these animals that you are uh, here a big colony there uh, so can you give some of them amalaki rasayana amalaki rasayana as you know is a methi rasayana very well known so i asked him can you give that and see what happens to this dna chain breaks he had shown a number of experiments 3 9 and 15 months these rats they lived for about 2 years so these were the time intervals 3 9 15 months he would look at the brain and naturally they will keep on breaking single and double chain breaks they will keep on increasing as they aged this was all well known so i asked him could you give this uh, amalaki rasayan he said oh there is no problem i can do that but when he did, did this amalaki rasayan which was made for us in cortical they make exactly as per the original protocol batch to batch consistency is there they were not it's not a commercial sap and uh, this he found surprisingly he was very much surprised more than me that these dna chain breaks were very much decreased in the test animals this was published in mechanism of aging and development which is a very important journal with the impact factor of 5 in their field aging research now that is an example that shows the uh, the, the, the genomic stability is much greater is preserved much better in these animals taking amalaki rasayana now that is evidence there is no question argument there very simple reproducible and now that is a, an example of uh, biovedic biology a simple experiment being done to show the efficacy of this that is one at the other end this was a limited uh, the whole project was done in two years uh, very nice published excellent but at the other end we had this difficult question of uh, the dosha prakriti vata pitta kapha is there a evidence at molecular level so far it is only the looking at uh, the physical traits behavioral traits mental traits then similarity to animal behavior some things like that uh, these uh, these are all mentioned in the brahatrai so you look at them and uh, an experienced physician maybe half an hour to 45 minutes they would interview a subject and then decide this is the this is how it was done now when we wanted to do this Uh, we had number of discussions on this including i very physicians in manipal uh, some visiting physicians would join uh, but how to go about this i had great worry about this variations if a physician uh, says something in uh, udupi another physician sees the same man in madras and he gives a different judgment how do you reconcile this these kind of doubts i had or the same person seeing another time he may make a different so how do you stand it how do you make it rigorous because we are thinking of doing molecular level studies and if the selection of the sample itself is so lax how is it going to be valid at all i had such great worries about this but anyway we had to make a beginning uh, so then we found when this doubt was going on there was a paper published from pune one mahale i had never met that person i think it was 2014 or around that time we had actually a paper published by bhushan patwarthan i think it's 2005 uh, they had talked about the uh, hla gene polymorphism and its possible relationship with uh, dosha prakriti they had only anticipated they had not done anything but that was there i had seen that i had actually talked to him also about it but this discussion here Uh, went, went on for quite some time but finally i found this mahalis paper what they had done was 
a group in uh, Pune over a period of uh, five years, I think, a CSR Institute, Pune University, Ayurveda Department, and uh, perhaps one other institution. They all got together a, a team. And, uh, they had actually given numbers, scores for all these traits. So that for me, I'm not an Ayurvedic person, so if I see 100 traits I mentioned, they're all the same for me. Numerical, I don't know, no numbers are there. For me, they're all the same. But for an Ayurvedic physician, they're not the same. Their significance is different. So Ayurvedic scholars were also in this, and they reached a consensus on the score for these. So they had numbers. So a Vata score is the highest, so that part since a Vata Prakriti, and the score may be 60 or 70, whatever, like that. And this they called Ayusoft. They published it. But nobody had ever used it. This was there in the literature. So I suggested to our uh, discussion group, why cannot we accept that with their permission, of course. And our idea was we will have a senior physician 10 years after his MD practicing Ayurveda activity. Such a person would see an individual A and he will make an intuitive assessment traditionally as they do it. Now, without that being diverged, he would go to a younger Ayurvedic physician, also MD in Ayurveda. And if he had gone, we would send them to Pune. It's very simple how to practice this Ayusoft assessment, computer-aided assessment. So we did that. We got people trained there. And when, our, when that young man sees this, he doesn't know what the senior physician had decided. He's blinded. A great worry whether there will be any agreement at all. <laughs> then the whole thing fails. But surprisingly, we found 75% there is agreement. Then we knew that all of us, there was no, no longer any doubt. That has been published, this particular. Anyway, so that way the subjects were taken. And then the study itself, FRLHT was part of it in this study. We had three uh, centers for patients. One was uh, Manipal Udupi or HDM College there, and a far holistic here in Bangalore with the white there, Gangadharan, and in Pune uh, University with uh, Kalpana Joshi, and white there, Nanal was involved in that. So we had through three centers for samples, and we had a total of uh, 3,500 subjects. And, uh, so these subjects, uh, if you want to distinguish them, separate them, they had have to have a dosha maximally expressed, each one of these. If they are a kind of mixture, it is very difficult to separate. So we decided in this ISOP scoring system, dosha had to be above 60%, then only we would take. So using that, we reduced this number to 262. That is our effective number. We decided again, we have molecular biologists from all these, so CCMB, we had uh, Tangaraj uh, from here, Kondaya from Indian Institute of Science, Satyamurti. We had a number of molecular biologists. So they all agreed uh, the, what markers should be used for their assessment. So the 1 billion SMPs were selected. And these 262 are very detailed uh, genomic and statistical analysis. They found there were 52 gen genetic markers which could, uh, even the severest uh, uh, referees agreed that th that would be sufficient to distinguish these three groups, one from the other. So a principal component analysis was done on these 262 SNPs in those subjects. And uh, clearly they classified themselves into three groups. And that is the paper which was uh, published in uh, Nature Reports. And that year in 2015, that they received 20,000 queries on that. So there is a tremendous amount of interest. A demonstration that this phenotypic classification has indeed a genomic basis. And they also found, which was totally unexpected, there's a PGMI gene, uh, which was almost constantly associated with Pitta phenotype. And this gene is at the center of a number of metabolic activity, number of metabolic actions. And that fits in with Pitta. Pitta is always dealing with uh, metabolism, activity, change, that 
tap, root itself means heating, changing, transform. So that uh, paper, that was a confirmation. But this study took almost four years. These three centers, a lot of money, and the principal scientific officers, uh, we overshot our budget, uh, but it was done. And now that is the uh, experimental work is uh, straightforward. We get an answer. But if you want to do it in human beings, then it's entirely different. You have to have all these done. Now that is an example of uh, uh, actual work done in molecular biology, in uh, Ayurvedic biology, sorry. We have done <laughs> good, many others are done, I will, this is typical. Great, sir. Yeah, that's a very uh, great example because that clearly shows the kind of, you know, diverse background that is uh, required for carrying out this kind of a work in the, under the heading of, you know, Ayurvedic biology. And uh, certainly, I am sure this will uh, inspire the uh, young researchers to take up this kind of, you know, research uh, uh, works in the uh, future. So, sir, I am sure, like, you now we have uh, many uh, attendees here, uh, both in YouTube as well as in this. So, I am sure uh, they also will have uh, some questions to you. So, I am requesting Dr. Mekha to uh, uh, maybe uh, open the, their audio to take some questions. Over to you, Mekha. Thank you. Yes. Um, so we have a couple of questions and I'll start out one which is quite blunt and I think very apt for our audience, which is how different is Ayurvedic biology from BAMS? From? From BAMS. AIMS, what's that? BAMS, uh, Ayurveda course, B degree. BAMS, Bachelor of Ayurveda course. Okay. Now, BAMS, you know, there is already a well-established uh, syllabus, curriculum. These are all prepared by the council. Uh, that has, uh, as far as I know, all I know is uh, the Sharaja Chandra Committee's report, uh, where she says that uh, uh, the present uh, syllabus, 70% of it is science and uh, modern medicine. This is what she says. I have not studied that. But as far as I know, this Ayurvedic biology, what we are talking about, uh, that uh, have, finds very little place. There will be Panchakarma mentioned, there will be the, uh, Dosha Prakriti mentioned, all those will be there. But this approach of uh, uh, doing studies in uh, biological sciences based on concepts in Ayurveda, based on mechanistic effects of uh, procedures, that kind of research nobody is doing, nobody has done it. In fact, it is a great surprise to me. Uh, Western scientists, when they came here, uh, they believed there was their interest was confined to medicinal plants only. They never considered the rest of Ayurveda as science at all. The British, for example, all the all the other Garcia, Diota, you name it. Nobody accepted there is anything in uh, the science in Ayurveda except medicinal plants, which I mentioned there emphasized all along that that's one reason all the work was on uh, taxonomy even Ramna Chopra pharmacology his if you read his writings he says he wants to supply medicines for uh, Indian public based from Indian sources that is drug development there was no question that we are not talking about drugs at all we are talking about biology uh, so there is a big difference in this and with the result, at that time, there was no way we could do molecular biology in those days, 1920 or 30. It couldn't be done. There was hardly any immunology at that time. I can understand no work was done in that. They were not used to study Ayurveda. But what about much, much later, when molecular biology was being done all over the place? Immunology was so popular. After transplantation, for example, it was an outburst. Everywhere it's immunology. Now, in spite of that, they were not being used in studying Ayurveda. Many of these problems were there, waiting to be done, but that was not done. So, uh, I don't know whether BAMS, BAMS essentially is to train medical doctors, people to train basic doctors. That is what BAMS is for. And they have adopted a lot from modern medicine. Where is the need for Ayurvedic biology for BAMS? They are training to become good physicians. Only a very few of them will opt 
to do research. Very few. For them, the teaching should be made sufficiently interesting. So those who are inclined, uh, they would come forward. My own experience is we have tried very hard when we were active in this uh, Ayurvedic biology. I tried very hard to get an MD in Ayurveda uh, to, as a, for a research fellowship, postdoctoral research. I couldn't get anybody. One person almost agreed, uh, but last minute they backed out. So it's not easy to get. That interest is not there. I think that's one of the reasons we wanted to do this course is because we have uh, it open to both people from Ayurveda background as well as people from uh, fundamental biology background. And we thought that these people should talk to each other. And if they talk to each other as colleagues, as, as friends, as academics together, then the intellectual atmosphere they can create will be far superior if they were to just continue in their own streams. And I'll just add that uh, I have shared the curriculum link for our uh, li uh, life sciences program, and that will give you some idea of how different this is from a BAMS. Um, and we actually right now, luckily, with our first batch, have uh, six students from a traditional medicine background, and we have eight students from a fundamental biology background. And we have been loving it. And just like what Sir said, we've been trying to do a combination. Um, in my biochemistry class, I taught about hair and keratin and you know what is the amino acid sequence of keratin. And then we tried to understand how, if I looked at it from that lens, to understand that from in a vata, pitta, and kapha, uh, prakriti person because hair is so different in all of these prakritis. So we are trying in our course in our very limited way, I must say, uh, to try to get people to think um, about very different fields, but together. So there is another question and I will uh, combine these three questions for you. And they are, uh, you know, very binary in a sense because they want to ask uh, when you have a scientific community that is rigid about what is evidence, that is um, uh, that describes the uh, modern science very differently from the way, say, Ayurveda describes its science, and you uh, meet uh, individuals who are very ensconced in their silos, how do you uh, see a, a future for this kind of an approach? Because there is nothing that is standardized or set um, in terms of doing the clinical trials. For example, um, if I had to do personalized medicine in a clinical trial, how would that work? So your thoughts on how to uh, reconcile the approaches and the languages to generate that evidence that is acceptable. Uh, uh, this Yes. Yes. Good. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, go please. ahead. Uh, Dr. Mehta, please uh, mute your mic. That may Sir, please go ahead, sir. No, the questions, uh, it's uh, rather complex. Uh, there is evidence based medicine, I said in the beginning, uh, that is exceedingly important. Uh, in modern medicine, what happens is, in fact, take pride that we are practicing evidence-based medicine. To a large extent, that is true. But the problem is that evidence was not produced in India. When you read uh, a journal or a text, etc., treating a heart disease or kidney disease, whatever else, I'm talking about modern medicine. Now, this, all the guidelines in uh, treatment, these are we are taking from Western literature. And they write it based on their own clinical trials. It is not somebody sitting in an office and writing. Because these are documented. They have very good medical record keeping. They know how to analyze this. And they come out in the form of textbooks, papers, and so on. And this is not something we started new. I was reading William Osler's textbook of medicine 100 years ago. It's a historical book. I happened to see it the other day. There was no clinical trial or anything at that time. But it is amazing, like tuberculin, what's being given in those days for a diagnosis of tuberculosis. 
he writes uh, my 500 patients. He was in Johns Hopkins. He writes the number of patients fibrinogen had been given, how many of them had reaction, what was the reaction. These are all recorded. So that kind of meticulous record keeping, they have a tradition like this. And they have all the subsequently clinical trials came there with statistics in the 20th century. Now all that is published and we use that here. So that is the evidence we have. It is not something that we have done here and created that, that we must realize. Now Ayurveda has no such thing they can borrow. There is no such uh, record, anything. So if, for example, Kotekal, P.K. Varya was a great physician. Those who were apprenticed under him, they will know this and they will treat like him. But what he did, everything, there is nothing documented. Clinical reserves, complications, how to handle the complications. There is nothing recorded. So this is our problem. So we have to address this prospectively. We cannot bring back the past. And I personally, uh, this is not... I am acutely aware that I am not an Ayurvedic physician. I am only a friend of Ayurveda. But I can only say that if you totally ignore evidence, there is no need for us. We are exceptional. That will not work very long. Because your own young Ayurvedic physicians will demand evidence. That is going to come. So what is necessary is, I feel, for example, this is a, I have spoken about it in several places. I'll mention that here. How to bring about evidence-based Ayurveda. I, I feel that is absolutely necessary. doesn't matter whether it comes in 10 years or 15 or 20 years. That's not the point. One or two generations it must come. Then evidence-based medicines, whether it is modern, there is a common platform. All of them can collaborate. The way to do it will be only the, just a few days ago in Kerala, they are building a big Ayurvedic Institute. I was telling them this. That is, if you want to take, and this applies only to around 20% of diseases, serious diseases, which requires inpatient treatment and so on. Most of these visit in a hospital, almost 60% of the patients coming there, they are small illnesses, no hospitalization. What in Ayurveda would be treated with shamana treatment, that there is no need for control trials and all that there. Simply shamana treatment, he'll be fine. But the other patients, that is different. I'm talking about those. That is where the problem, the cost, complications, mortality, they're all coming there only. That is where this should apply. Now, their clinical trial means you have to have a large number of patients. Suppose Parkinson's disease, take one. Long, prolonged illness, uh, complications, death, etc. And a disease like this, if you want to have a standardized a protocol for treatment, evidence-based, you have to have a large number of patients, a standard protocol, one or two protocols you are trying. Based on, they're all done by Ayurvedic physicians. Nobody else, don't involve modern doctors. So if you are doing that, where do you get all these patients? You cannot follow up for 10 years. You need to establish a protocol as superior. Everybody should accept it, preferably. In that case, you need a number like 200 patients, maybe more statistically to be valid. That is our strength, not because great names are involved. Nobody will accept it. If you have patients, protocol-based treatment, large numbers statistically valid. This cannot be done in the present way. Large hospital, in a year, they may have 10 patients with Parkinson's. It's no, no good. How do you get 200 or 300 patients? So you should have something like the NIH type of hospital, research hospital. It's totally different. It's not a hospital, really. If you have a, a place like that, a clinical center, call it that, not a hospital, they will accept, say, Parkinson's. I'm giving an example only. Request all the hospitals in that state, send your Parkinson's patients here. All the, they have the facilities to do the investigation. Treatments will be done. There will be doctors there, core doctors, and consultants from different places. And the one or two protocols are tried. Inpatient, they can come back for follow-up, etc. The whole course is finished in three years. You will get 200 patients. At the end of it, you see what the two protocols are 
compared. Protocol 2 is better. Based on that, you prepare guidelines for practice. The patient comes, what are the diagnostic methods? What is the diagnosis? How that is established? What is the treatment you are going to follow? All these guidelines are there. A fresh the BAMS doctor should be able to treat. And his strength comes from the clinical trial. It is not the opinion of a, of a doctor. That is the strength. And uh, that hospital or clinical center, they close down that unit and the next will be another type of patient they will be admitting. That's it. Different doctors will come. Many good doctors will want to work on deputation. This is all free, incidentally, because these patients who are coming, they are making an invaluable gift, knowledge. Without them, this cannot be done. So if this is done over a period of, it's not a quick fix, five years, you cannot do this. But in a generation, if you have 10 diseases, you have practice guidelines established. I think you will find a transformation in the practice of Ayurveda. Young Ayurvedic doctors will not be going and working in nursing homes as it is happening today. Because today, some of them tell me the Ayurvedic colleges I used to go for graduation day and all that. Many times they come and talk to me informally. They have their own worries. One, there are no jobs. Second, when they cannot get any jobs, they have no confidence in treatment. That also they tell me. If I have no confidence, to start a practice. So they end up in nursing homes. Nursing homes, they are working as physicians' assistants. There is no, very little Ayurveda there. After four or five years, they are well paid, self-respect. But after four or five years, they cannot really become good Ayurvedic physicians. So they set up their own nursing home. What happens to Ayurveda under these circumstances? These are things which as a friend of Ayurveda, I worry about. But I think the clinical, that evidence, that there must be a way of doing this. I cannot see any other way. Okay. I think that there are some questions here that are to do with basic science and biology. And since we want to talk more about the... Uh, the field and the discipline rather than the intricacies. I have answered those questions online itself. And uh, I think we'll take one last question, sir, and that uh, we'll end with that. It's uh, how do we reduce the gap you feel between research and practice in Ayurveda? I think the uh, practice It would be very difficult to do both, uh, very hard, I think, uh, to spend uh, adequate time. But in our Ayurvedic biology program, in all these projects that we have done, we had Ayurvedic physicians collaborating with us. From Kotekal, Vaidya Gangadharan here, Nanal in Pune. In fact, no project is done without Ayurvedic physicians as participants. Now, they are all busy clinicians. Now, that kind of a collaboration is uh, one way of doing this. But if there is much more involvement in the experimental work, for example, uh, that will be very hard. I think they, uh, because the science part of it is uh, very demanding, like uh, Dosha Prakriti, the kind of uh, uh, work at the DNA level or SMPs, computer estimations and all that, this take full time work. And to be involved in that uh, very fully, that will be hard to do that. That is not what is required of a physician. The medical inputs, Ayurvedic inputs are what we need. That is done. We have already done that in almost every project of ours. And we should encourage that so that when they come out of the Ayurvedic college, they should be friends of, of research. That is uh, respect for research. You know, respect for the research scientists, accept them as equals, all those, then only collaboration will work. If they become second-class citizens, physicians are always, that I think will not work. Okay, we uh, now um, 
we'll close this session as I would like to invite uh, Professor Darshan Shankar. Sir, if you have any closing remarks. You have to unmute, sir. No, I, I would just like to thank all of you for organizing this. I don't think I have anything to add to the clarity and lucidity with which Professor Valyathan shared his experiences. Uh, I expect that the entire audience has enjoyed this conversation. And um, we look forward to much more support from both scientists and educational institutions in order to take this field of Ayurvedic biology forward. That's that's all that I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And uh, our next speaker uh, will be uh, Dr. DBA Narayanan, a very respected pharmacologist uh, from the industry side. And uh, that seminar is due 17th March. So we hope to see you all back there. Bye-bye and good evening. Yes, good night and thank you. Thank you.